It was an honor to talk with Sarah Jean about the kinds of work that she does in Japan, as well as her work with Mirai no Mori, an organization supporting youth in Japan. Doing more of this uh, cross-cultural communications and conflict mediation work. And we're really doing introductory stuff because I realized, like I was so hesitant because, oh, you know, doing conflict mediation is really hard, but the entrance point to conflict mediation is communication skills. It's more like, I don't not conflict avoidance, but how do we deal with it at the entry point before it becomes full-blown conflict? Yeah. And that's kind of where I think I'm better at than going into the bringing the parties together and doing, because that's really, we need a lot more practice and a lot more time to do that. But I'm really thinking this is something I would like to do more of as we become more internationalized in our workplace. Yeah. And this is where, Sometimes it's language, sometimes it's culture, sometimes it's knowledge, sometimes it's just the environment. It's multi, it's multifactorial. Yeah. I did a training in Ju June, June, July, which was about 30 people from 24 countries, from developing countries, and it was so exciting. I mean, we did about half of what I planned because there I could see there's language, there's religious, there's expect, there's what they're used to in their context. So in the morning, we just focus on communication skills. In the afternoon, on expectations and assumptions. We didn't even really get to mediation. like, But just that entry point where conflict starts. Yeah. And, that's a, and then who you are as an individual, right? Your own personal yeah. experience. You're university educated. I'm not, right? So we're living in... You know, or people who are, in this case, people who are pastors who see themselves as really high in the hierarchy right. and other place pastors who see themselves as one of the people. Very yeah. different. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. So that was, so that really made me think, oh, I can do this with like this entry, like really before conflict becomes something big, there's a lot yeah. we can do. Definitely. So I do some trainings for JICA. I do some trainings at universities. Um, actually, it's really recently I started teaching university students. I've been doing programs for adults through Temple, through Tsude University for years, for like 13, 14, 15 years. Um, JICA for about 14 years. Um, so bits and pieces, dribs and drabs. Even when I was working for the U.S. Foundation, it was part-time. Mm -hmm. um, I do a program once a year through a Washington, Washington D.C. based organization. So it's bits, bits and pieces. And very international. Japan and international is where your funding coming from. Yeah. Even for a lot of the Japan programs, the funding comes from U.S. organizations. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, so even a Japan platform, which is a Japanese NGO, I coordinated a training for them that was... Japanese, I didn't do the training myself. I coordinated the different trainers that people working in humanitarian relief. So we had people, mostly NGOs were from Japan, but there were also groups from China, Taiwan, South Korea. All that funding came from the U.S. It's really hard to do that type of international training in Japan and get funding from Japan. And it's, and I, and it's about being really good with following up with people. Yeah. But, yeah, my work now in Japan is all based in Tokyo, but um, I did, I did my, when I came back to Japan in 2000 after graduate school, my work was like from Hiroshima to Sendai, because I was responsible for a Japan, U.S. Japan program, but the Japan side. So I like that because I like going a different place every day. Uh, yeah. The needs are there. The needs yeah. are there. So it's you need people like you that understand the needs of other countries outside Japan. Yeah. A lot of the Japanese people, I imagine you know better than me, but Japanese people working in Japan don't often travel. They don't often work. Right. Abroad, right. Right? right. Or even, you know, like even with this mediation group, you know, some of the when we are practicing and doing some of our trainings, this expectation that, OK, somebody's going to work 
It doesn't matter if it's a, you're going to work in an American company in Japan, it's going to be run like an American company. No. Or you're going to work in a Japanese company, all the foreign staff has to act the same as the Japanese. That's not how it works. It's much more complicated. These things, it's not just cut and paste. Nothing is, you know. And and I do believe personally, because social media, a lot of people's real in, in term particularly younger, and I don't mean to be biased about this, so there's a lot of people whose interpersonal communications are not good. Yes. They're used to just giving, sending a text and that's it, right? And you got to go deeper a lot of times. Yeah, for sure. To create a shared yeah. understanding, yeah. We, we have the technology, so doing Skype and face-to-face -face things like this is makes a big difference. Yeah, yeah. I think it's really... and it, 15 minutes meetings are so good compared to like 28 texts. Yeah. <laughs> Mirai Nomori was actually originally more like a CSR project of a company called English Adventure. Okay. And English Adventure does summer camps in Japan for Japanese kids, basically. It's Jap all Japanese kids. But they have an element of their summer camp that's in English, mm -hmm. right? It's not 100%. They have different levels and whatever. Anyway, so the founder, of the head of that company, David Paddock, was introduced to me because in 2010, he decided his company was doing well. He would like to do something to give back to the community. So he said, how about, you know, as kind of a CSR project, they'll do a little um, like a summer camp for kids who can't afford to go. Specifically, kids from orphanages was just, and it was just going to be like a, you know, besides all of their camps that they do as a business, they would integrate some kids from orphanages into the, um, into their general summer camps. And then what happened with the Tohoku disaster, um, they thought they would work, you know, work with an MPO that was already working with kids in orphanages, right? So that was their idea, 2010. Um, and, and the kids have so many social needs. Um, they actually can't integrate them. Now, Mirai Nomori's focus is using the great outdoors mm -hmm. for empowerment. And what that means is taking kids out of their ordinary environment. Mm -hmm. Bringing kids together from elementary to junior high and a few high school students more as support assistance. Um, taking them out of their ordinary environment, using the outdoors um, and the different experiences you can have in the outdoors to, to understand yourself, to develop your own sense of who you are, and to actually help empower kids by giving them opportunities but at the same time, uh, bringing staff from the children's homes. And there's three reasons. One is because they're overworked. Many of the social welfare workers in Japan are overworked and underpaid. Yeah. yeah. So they don't actually get a chance to get out of the box. Many of them also grew up in those homes. Mm -hmm. So they are not self-empowered oftentimes either. They just really want to help kids, protect kids, but they to give them some stimulus to get new ideas about fun things kids can do. They're not necessarily empowerment focused either to give them those opportunities. And also, you know, just they don't they don't have a chance to take a vacation either. So, um, so it's really like opening up the world. So Mirai Nomori has three focal points, you know, one is the outdoors, and the outdoors is really the way. Um, and it isn't big things like skiing, surfing, you know, hang gliding, not that level, which ordinary kids who say go to English Adventure, you know, whose parents can afford to pay for that camp, you know, they go on vacations with their family. They do those things. Mirai Nomori in the wintertime is doing snowshoeing. You know, in the summertime or fall, winter, any time of the year, doing hiking, doing, you know, really basic rock climbing, jumping in the river, you know, 
these kids for the kids in orphanages, these are all new things. So it doesn't have to be that high level, you know, very expensive. So, and kids build their own confidence by going not just once a year and never going again, but say going in the summer, then maybe going to a craft making in the fall, maybe going to something next spring. So there's a certain ratio of kids that repeat where you can see kids say over the course of the, the summer camp is one week that by the end of the week, maybe they start talking to other kids. The second time they go to the camp, they're going to help another kid. Um, and the same thing with the, with the staff from the homes. You, I could see, even though I've only gone to the, the summer one week camp once, the staff who were there before helped the other staff and help lead the way for the kids, like jump off the rock. Kids not that, and there's no pressure for the kids. They don't have to jump into the river. You know, some kids will help each other. Some will say last year, you know, I didn't want to do it, but I said this year I'm going to try or, you know, help another kid. So, and it's those little things that start. And for the one kid that there's a story, the staff often tells kid who had never been on the Shinkansen, never been. And that was just really scary. The first time around the train goes by so fast. You're there and like a five or six year old, like first grader hiding under the, the, the seats that are on the waiting area because just so scary. But um, with the other kids' encouragement, you know, come on down, and then was scared by this big group of kids from all these different homes. And that's another thing, to meet kids from different parts of Japan that are in the same situation. And one of the ambassadors for, uh, which are like advisors, um, is a, for Mirai no Mori, is a, is a professional boxer who grew up in a home. Mm -hmm. That was because his parents were too poor. Uh, Sak Sakamoto-san, he was a Golden Gloves champ. And I've met him several times, and I've been there twice when he's done his, he does a little talk, shows a video of his, like, story, and um, does a boxing demonstration, like, just, like, punching in, like, the big mitts help kids like ways of getting out all their frustration of all their sadness. And some kids, it's really great for some kids. It's very traumatic and he knows how to deal with the different kids, different ways. That's and, nice. Like somebody who has that experience. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're used to seeing stars, right? But we don't have that kind of celebrity fatigue in Japan. Generally, if somebody went through the homes, they're going to hide it. Right. Right. If somebody even lived there, say, for a year, because that's a big shame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So other organizations like Run for the Cure had years before they could find, like, women who survived breast cancer could come out because that's a shame. Yeah. So, and I think, you know, for the kids to see also somebody like Sakamoto-san, who actually was a Golden Gloves champ years ago, and his staff come and see... Like there's something also other than working in the home. So, but to see there's other opportunities, that's the thing about seeing somebody like Sakamoto-san, who even though he's, you know, educationally, you know, he struggled in school. He's a, and the kids just all eyes glued on him, like to see somebody who's gone through that. Besides money, so money's one type of donation, but there's often in-kind donations we need for the camps themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, so some things would be like specialized, like that's why some of the sporting goods companies are big supporters, you know, maybe their shoes or equipment. Um, and then Mirai no Mori has, um, usually a summer and winter party that we, all of our prizes are donated. They might be bottles of wine that they might be a weekend away. Um, and also volunteers, are important for organizing those events and doing a lot of the PR. Mm -hmm. Volunteers are really instrumental in the big summer and winter fundraising event, mm -hmm. as well as online giving types of like uh, that we do in the summer and winter. Um, the other thing is uh, there are some, we just have like two paid, three paid regular staff. Um, but for the summer camps, there are 
camp counselors. A lot of them are English teachers mm -hmm. because they, or teachers because they can take off that mm -hmm. one month. So we're always looking for new people. They're not paid highly, but they are paid because it is a big responsibility. And then there are volunteers that actually go for the one day. Those are those can be volunteers. Um, we're always looking for, say, um, people to do either their own small volunteering event or to help promote. Promotion is the biggest thing because it takes a lot of time. But generally in spring and fall, she has volunteers, whether adult volunteers, corporate volunteers, student volunteers, say from between the big camps. The big camps are January and August. So then like February to July or so, and then September to December. I was really impressed by the time and effort and passion that Sarah Jean puts into the projects that she does in Japan. She's a true inspiration.